Good morning, everybody. Glad you could make it to worship service today. I have a few announcements. Uh, Eileen Spears' 90th birthday uh, is coming up, and address for cards is in the bulletin. Annual reports will now be collected in January, and the meeting at 11.22 this month on the 22nd will be to adopt the 2021 budget and elect members to boards and committees. And now I have two other announcements. The following two proposals will also be considered on the 22nd. The first proposal is to transfer $10,000 from general fund savings to building fund for the trustees' use. There have been some expenses that, and some things that had to be taken care of and that the trustees have done, uh, but we need to pay for them now. And then we're going to consider uh, giving them a, a line item so they can continue the work and uh, without having to, to uh, come back, they can pay for it up front, basically. And then the second proposal is uh, we uh, have been in contact with the Moorlands and it's become clear uh, that the Moorlands have decided that uh, they're not going to be able to come as called by this body. And therefore on the 22nd, two weeks from now, we will consider um, rescinding the offer that we made for them to come and also at the same time to institute or reinstitute the search committee at that time to go out and try and find a new pastor. I would hope that you would be in prayer uh, over the course of the next two weeks. Uh, they've been in prayer. Their, their heart is, is broken about this, but uh, they're not in a position where they feel that at this time they've, they've any longer been called here. And so uh, it's, it behooves us to be in prayer with, uh, to the Lord and find who that next man and his family are for, right for us. And now uh, we do have, lastly, Operation Christmas Child, Christmas Child Shoebox Collection will be next Sunday, the 15th, and uh, during the morning worship service. And we're just going to have a short little video to uh, promote that. being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Welcome. Uh, I have uh, enlisted the services of a good friend. And uh, would you join us um, in prayer? And then we're going to sing a couple hymns. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for uh, drawing us to yourself in a faith relationship with your son, Jesus. Thank you for drawing us here this morning to 
to lift up your name in worship. Thank you for the privilege it is to gather freely. Thank you for this time, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to move in our midst in a wonderful way to experience you in a new and fresh way. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand and sing beginning hymn number 688, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Lord, thank you for music. Thank you for speaking to us in words of hymns, for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for uh, Ted. Thank you for anointing him this morning, Lord. And uh, we look forward to the message that he brings directly from you out of your word. Bless him, Lord. Pray your blessing on us that we would be attentive, that our hearts would be open, our ears open, our minds open. Open our spirits, Lord, to receive and then to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. I trust that you had a great week this week. I actually had an uh, unusual situation yesterday. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this, but somehow while I was mowing my grass on a uh, riding lawnmower, I ended up running over my wallet. Uh, can anybody borrow, borrow me a couple bucks? I, uh, <laughs> So I do have my driver's license, Martin. My driver's license, they're good, I'm good. Um, uh, but I lost all my credit cards. Uh, Deb took care of that. So, uh, you know, what can I say? It's a week. Thank God we can come here. I can come here and be uplifted by the, uh, the prayers and the songs and the praising of Jesus. So thank you for that. Um, I do, before I share the message, I do want to reach out to those folks who may be listening um, my understanding, there's some folks there in Tampa, in Florida, other areas, that um, hurricane is coming. And so we need to be in mindful prayer for them, for their protection. So Father God, we thank you for, we thank you for even as we uh, talk about this, this morning, the storms in our life. Lord, that you are in control. And so Lord, I would pray that you would send your band of angels, your guardian angels, to surround those folks who are down there in the path of harm's way, that you would... Watch over them, protect them, Lord, that you would lead them and just be part of your support, the part of your power that you would bestow upon them. And so, Lord, we do trust and put them in your mighty, righteous hand. Pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, this morning, I want to take you a little bit different. Although we're still going to stay in and around the Sea of Galilee, we're still going to be talking about a boat, but we're not going to be talking about fishing. We're not going to be talking about fishing this time. We're going to talk about a series of events of what Jesus and his disciples encountered this time on the lake or the Sea of Galilee. And so what I want to read to you this morning comes from the book of Matthew the 14th chapter, and we're going to read the uh, verses 22 through 33. And those of you who might be Luke fans, you can find the same event presented in Luke 6, excuse me, Mark, Mark 6, not Luke, Mark 6, verses 45 through 51. So would you follow along? Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, and after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And during the fourth watch the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw, them walk, saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. 
But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat and the wind died down, then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. In this passage, in this passage, we see the storm that Jesus describes. In a previous passage, it's in Mark, or in Matthew, Matthew 8 and Mark 4. If you remember that, that's when the disciples were in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, the storm came. This time Jesus was sleeping, right? They woke Jesus up, and then Jesus was able to calm the storm, and they experienced an incredible miracle. This time, Jesus is nowhere to be seen, at least initially. They're out in the boat. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 when Jesus put them in the boat, said, go to the other side. But initially, Jesus was not part of them, and so they really did not know what to expect. His presence wasn't apparent. And it's kind of like the, the apostles or the disciples. Sometimes when we get into storms of our life, we wonder where Jesus is. Where is God in all of this? And sometimes we might think we have a hard time finding where he is. Or asking the question, where are you, God? What do we do then? What are the anchors? What are the anchors we have that we can use when we're being tossed like that boat in our life in these kind of storms? Well, I want to share with you this morning, there's really two main types of anchors and different designs, but they're basically the same. It comes from the same one. This one is a mushroom anchor. You may have seen it. It's a cutie. Kind of like Jim over here. <laughs> nice round features. Soft. Easy to get along with. Hmm? Amen. Huh? This anchor works primarily on its weight. It's able to hold a boat in this calm water, but when you get a wind, when you get a tempest, this anchor is of no use. This anchor in a storm gets dragged along with the boat. But a lot of people like this anchor because it looks nice. It seems to be just fitting. And this is the anchor that's like the anchor of the world. This is the anchor that people normally like to see. But there's another type of anchor. It's called the Danforth anchor. And those of you may be in the Navy, a Navy anchor. Now that looks nasty, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's complicated. It might look a little medieval. But this anchor works on the principle that the harder the storm, the harder that boat rocks, the harder that wind blows, this anchor digs down into that bottom and anchors that boat. This is the anchor of God. And so this morning, I want to share with you five godly anchors that God has given to you and I, each of us, to be able to hold in that storm. So that when Jesus calls you out of that boat, that rocking boat that's being tossed by the waves, that storm of your life, you can come out and you can walk on that water with Jesus. So the first anchor that I would share with you is that we are guided, we are guided by God's providence. You see, Jesus allowed this storm 
to be. He allowed it to happen. And if you read the, the parallel passages of Mark and Matthew, you make it clear. The, the disciples are in the storm because Jesus wanted them to be there. He sent them to the boat and he sent them to that storm on purpose. Now Matthew says Jesus constrained them. And that's an interesting word. Constrain means to direct, to drive, compel, to force. And so what Jesus was doing, and, and the disciples had just, as I said before, just finished up seeing Jesus perform the miracles of feeding the 5,000. So they were on a high. But Jesus made them go because he had something else in mind. Kind of reminds me of a young Boy Scout who was going to his troop meeting but when questioned about his tardiness by his scoutmaster, this is what the boy said. He says, well, it took me a long time because I was doing my good deed today. I was trying to help an old lady cross the street. And the scoutmaster said, well, what took you so long? And the little boy said, because she didn't want to cross the street. He was forcing, that young lad was forcing that elderly lady to cross the street, and she didn't want to. Just like Jesus constrained or forced the disciples, knowing that their course would intersect the great storm. Because we know that if the disciples had stayed, they would have been dependent on Jesus, and they would have been riding his coattails all along. This was an opportunity that Jesus had to teach him something. And we were all attracted to power. We all liked that power. But Jesus wanted his disciples to be able to stand on their own, just as he'd have us stand on our own, even without initially his presence, which is what they thought when they first encountered the storm. He proved he could walk on the water, but he wanted to take this storm to give an opportunity to show them that they could do the same, that they could walk on water through their faith. And I think the point sometimes when we read the passage is that God would send us into these the storms for testing. I don't know how many of you may have been in a storm of testing. And maybe sometimes it's a storm um, that he's delivering you from temptation. So maybe testing, maybe temptation. He may be sparing you and I from the worst that might be heading towards us. Something we can't see. Something we can't look down the road. I don't know about you, but I, I think it's to be better in God's will in the storm than out of God's will in the calm. I think God's will is the safest place we could be. God is more concerned about our spiritual growth than our personal comfort. And I know he loves us just as, he are, as we are, but he also loves us too much to leave us that way. We're all under construction. We're all being made to the image of him. And he sees down the road, he can see our past, and he can see how he is molding us into the image of him. As we said, he was, he was present in the first storm. He proved there to be. But the disciples couldn't see him in this second storm as we read in the scripture. Peter learned to look at Jesus. He was the first. He looked at Jesus even when he couldn't see him. So even in the storm, God is control. He knew down the road that Peter would one day be crucified upside down. John would be exiled to the island of Patmos, or some say he was actually boiled in a cauldron of oil. James would be beheaded in Jerusalem. Luke would hang from an olive tree in Greece. And Mark would be dragged to death in the streets of Alexandra. Jesus takes them all through a gradual process of bigger and bigger storms along their journey. 
The disciples may have been scared to death. I don't know. They certainly would seem I would be under those circumstances. But at the end, they realized that they were going through the storm, not because they were out of God's will, but because they were in God's will. Some storms are made for, or for correction. Remember Jonah? Remember Jonah? Sometimes we drift off course, and God needs to bring that storm to blow us back, bring us back into where he wants us to be, where we're supposed to be. Seems a little boy lost his boat off the pond bank. And he was crying because his boat was far away. And a gentleman heard that and he said, I'll help you. And he immediately began, he picked up big rocks and he started throwing them at the boat. And the little boy was screaming, he was crying, he was going to lose his boat. But what the man was really doing was throwing the rocks beyond the boat to cause a ripple, to cause some waves that eventually would bring the boat back to the little boy's hands. Sometimes God uses ripples, and sometimes tsunami waves to bring us back to him, depending on the nature, depending on the circumstances. Sometimes it is a storm of correction. But we can thank God. In all of this, we can thank God for the storm because he's in control. And we're guided by his providence. Some storms are also for perfection, like the ones that we read in Matthew here. Perfection for the disciples. Even when we deal with the tough times and the rough times, either way, we know that God's in control. He's leading us by his providence. I don't know how many of you play chess, but... Sometimes when you're playing, many times when you're playing a good chess player, that person already knows how this game's going to end just by watching what you're doing. You may think you're going to win. You may think you're moving in the right direction, but that's not the case. You always end in the same place of really losing because that person knows the moves. That person knows not only their moves, your moves, and can look ahead. You know, we think we can take the world and make it whatever we want to be and do whatever we want, but that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's not how it's going to end up. God is the one that's in control. God is the one that has our preference. And so the first godly anchor that I shared with you this morning is that we are guided by his providence. Jesus has allowed your storm to be just like the disciples. The second, the second anchor I want to share with you is we are graced by his prayers, by Jesus' prayers. We all want to be praying, but you realize to Jesus, but you realize Jesus is praying to us and for us. Think about this. When we are in a place of peril, Jesus is in a place of prayer. When we are in a place of peril, Jesus is in a place, a place of prayer. Go back to the reading in Mark. The disciples are in the boat dealing with their situation. Jesus is up in the mountain praying but he can see the disciples rowing and they can see the disciples in their predicament, in their situation. He can see them, but they can't see Jesus. Jesus intercedes for each and every one of us when we're in our storm, whatever that storm may be. He is there watching. He is there praying. The disciples were in a place of peril, but Jesus was in a place of prayer. And just like the disciples, Jesus is praying for each and every one of us in our time of storm. Seems a little boy, a little boy got in trouble with his mother. And so 
He was mad at his mother. And, but at bedtime, he knelt down to give his prayers. And so he prayed and asked God to bless Daddy and Sissy and Bubby, his brother, and his dog, Biff, and his cat and his fish and friends, and, but not his mother. And at the end of the prayer, he smirked and he looked at his mother and said, I guess you noticed you weren't in it. <laughs> well, that's not what Jesus tells us. That's not the way it is with Jesus. The good news, the good news is that today, no matter what, no matter what we've done against him, Jesus is praying for us, for you and me. We are in his prayers. And so the first anchor is allowing Jesus to allow this storm to be in our lives. But remember, we're guided by his providence. And this anchor, anchor is that Jesus, even amidst our storm, maybe we can't see him, he's praying for us. And so we're graced by his prayers. And the third anchor we will be gladdened by his presence. You and I are gladdened by his presence. Jesus will come to us in our time, his time. And just like the disciples, that storm will be calm. That storm will be stopped. You know, the fourth, in the, in the Bible, we read about the fourth watch of the night is between 3 a.m. and dawn. And um, I don't know about you guys, who, gals who may be going hunting or whatever, you're out there early enough, and boy, that is a, a difficult time. It always seems to be the coldest, too. I can't, I can't say about the Sea of Galilee, but I know when I'm on the tree stand, and I'm up there, and it's 3, 4 o'clock, it's cold. But there they are. It's the darkest of the night, and they see Jesus walking on the water. Now, some skeptics say, well, no, he was actually walking on the, on the shore. It's a mirage. And so you hear these kind of critics, but the Bible says they were far out into the water, and if you look at some translations, talk about many stadia, many stadia would mean miles out. A number of skeptics just have problems accepting this truth. Another story that kind of hits this is there was a lady walked into a butcher shop, and the guy behind the meat counter said, can I help you? And she's looking at the chickens. She was looking for a chicken that was much larger. And she said to the clerk, do these chickens get any bigger? No, ma'am, they're dead. <laughs> Sometimes we try to really get into the skeptics that, and, and you know, brothers and sisters, here's what I believe. I believe Jesus had the power to take every little drop of that lake, join hands, bring Jesus up to the top of that water. Jesus can do that. He's greater than the laws. He's certainly greater than the law of gravity. Even gravity bows down to the king and king and the Lord of lords. That's a small miracle for him. But why did, Jesus, why did Jesus deal with the disciples in the manner walking on the water? I think to show them that the thing they feared the most, he was in control of. We all have fears. That's natural. But Jesus is greater than those fears. You see, the waves that were over their heads were under his feet. The waves that were over their heads were under his feet. And folks, I don't care what storm you go through, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, physical, and I know this has been a trying time for a lot of us just on the groundwork. Can imagine the individual storms that you all are going through. But I want to encourage you today. We have anchors. We have godly anchors that we can rely on. 
and we can look at those anchors in our storms. And then as we read in the passage, we see that they call out when Jesus is walking on the water, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. Again, kind of reminds me of the story of two security guards in the hospital morgue. One says to the other, are you afraid of ghosts? No, but I'm scared of them. I'm scared of them. He was being honest. He was being honest. Do you believe in ghosts? No, but I'm scared of them. I mean, just as it looked like things were worse in the storm, here comes Jesus walking on the water, and they think it's a ghost because they were living by fear and not living by faith. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I had just come off of seeing Jesus miraculously feel the 5,000 have bread left over, well, 5,000 plus, right? Ladies and children, not in college. I think I would be on an emotional, spiritual high. I'd be really in awe. But for some reason, they couldn't see Jesus in this event. But they did learn. They did learn something. They learned that faith is a believing in something you can't always see. You probably memorized Hebrews 11.1 1 for those. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, you might say, I don't see God is in this. I don't see how God is in this. Exactly. Exactly. Because that gives you a chance to test your little mustard seed of faith. I mean, hadn't they already seen Jesus in a storm? We just talked about the one that he was in the boat and how he calmed that ravaging storm. And he made the waves lay peaceful just like a tired puppy. They'd seen it. They experienced it. Well, they had a good reason to strengthen their faith. Jesus bringing and building their faith during this storm. And so do you and I no matter what our storm is, no matter what the trial and tribulation is. We shouldn't let imagination run wild with paranoia. You know, the devil works in the realm. He works in the realm of the mind. And so we shouldn't live by fear. We should live by faith. That's what God calls us. And then the fourth anchor I want to share with you is we are guarded by his power. The storm has power over us, but Jesus has power over that storm. The disciples were afraid, first of the water, but then they were afraid of the most was Jesus walking on top of it. Some may say if Trump wins the re-election we're sunk. Or if Biden wins the election, we're doomed. And I don't know where it is. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Maybe it's over. Maybe it's not over. I don't know. But brothers and sisters in Christ, what I do know is Jesus is still king. The tomb is still empty. We're on God's side. And I know we'll come on top. Amen. 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 And the last anchor I want to share with you that Jesus showing us that we're growing in our purpose. I mentioned we're all under construction no matter how young, how old until the day that Jesus calls us home. So you and I, we are growing in his purpose. Maybe you haven't thought about it. But the storms that come in our everyday life help us grow in faith. Faith is like film. It's best developed in the dark. It's best developed in the dark. 
you know, on that boat that night, that lovable and loud Peter, what must have been going on in his mind or the minds of his friends when he decides to get out of that boat? Think about that. That's crazy. That's way different than anything G Jesus or Peter, in this case, has ever done. But he confidently jumps out of that boat, lands on water that feels like concrete, and he's walking on water with his Lord and Savior, Jesus. Can you imagine how awesome that would be? Over your mind, over your spirit, over, I mean, I'm walking on water. I'm like my Lord and Savior, Jesus. I know. It's easy to criticize Peter because we know what happens. We know that as he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he ends up sinking. But I tell you this, at least he got out of the boat. At least he was willing to answer the call. And my challenge to you all this morning is, Let's not be boat people. Let's be people who are willing to go out and step out of that boat and be water walkers. We need to take the risks. We need to try things we have never tried before. We need to be able to fail and get back up and try again. Because if we aim it, nothing, we're sure to hit it. God's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for perfection. Just someone to get out of the boat and try something once. Have you ever been on a short-term missionary trip? Would you give it a try? Have you ever witnessed to anybody? A couple Sundays ago, remember the fishing tackle box? You have all the tools to do that. You can go out to witness to people. Ever give your first 10% of your paycheck before you pay the bills? That's a challenge. That would be a challenge to see if you could outgive God. I can stand before here. I cannot outgive God. That doesn't happen. Even when you don't have much, you give what you have. God will multiply that. That's faith. I think Peter learned a lot that day. I think the disciples learned a lot about that, that day, not only about themselves, but about Jesus, their Lord. He learned that when fear rises, faith dies. He learned to keep his eyes on Jesus and not on the storm. And that each one of us, just like Peter, can be a water walker. See, fear is looking at God through your circumstances. But faith is looking at your circumstances through God. We need to live above those circumstances. We need to love about those storms, not under them. This may be hard, but don't waste your storm. Don't let the opportunity that you may going through, the trials and tribulations, the heartbreak, the emotion, the physical pain, the spiritual pain, don't waste it. It would be a shame to go through it and not learn the lessons that Peter did and the rest of the disciples. I don't know whether your storm would be for perfection or correction, but Jesus will allow it. Be sure of that. He'll allow your path and his paths to cross. And don't leave here without understanding that when we are in a place of peril, when you are in a place of peril, Jesus is in a place of prayer. He may seem far away. He may be where you don't see him or don't feel him, but he's there providing intercession for you.
He'll come on his own time to reach out with his hand to give you this word. Come. Come out. Take my hand in this storm. So anchor yourself with God's anchor. Don't rely on this worldly anchor. It's useless. It may look pretty. It may look nice. But it's ineffective in the storm. God's anchor. That's the anchor that will hold no matter what. Friends, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. Amen? Amen. Let's join together as we close our service by singing hymn number 793. Shall we stand? Father God, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the anchor, your son Jesus, who is above the storm, that simply at the words, the storm quiets, the waves cease. And Lord, we ask that you be with us. Be our anchors in the individual storms that we face. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over our vets. Lord, we do thank you for those who served this country. We ask that you watch over, protect them. 
Lord, that your power, your resurrection power would be more than sufficient to bring them out of this darkness of depression and despair. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you again that we can come here, to sing and praise, to hear your word, to worship, to fellowship. Lord, that is what our church, your church, your bride is all about. And so, Lord, we thank you for these. We ask that you bless us this week. We ask that you give us mercies and grace. And, Lord, that you allow us to be your light, your salt, your ambassador of your son, Jesus. And so may the power of the Lord be with you. May the love and peace of his son be evermore. And may the love and understanding with you, Lord, be with us all. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.